great from the good and will help you adapt to the challenges of hiring remotely. This brings faster hiring, reduces bias, and gives your engineers more time to solve problems that matter. That's why we're already working with some of the best engineering teams in the world. Schedule a demo with us to learn how we can help you shape the future of work today. Codility. Remote tech hiring everywhere. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel on how to build a data-driven HR and recruitment strategy. I'm Jason Medley, Chief People Officer at Fidelity. Welcome. We're so excited to have this conversation with you today. Um, before I really tee up the topic and, and our, of course, wonderful panel, I'd like to give a special thanks to our partners today, Jim and Lever. Thank you so much for all the behind-the-scenes work that you've done and all of those here at Fidelity as well who've helped make this uh, webinar possible today. Thank you so much. Um, it's a very interesting time, to say the least, in terms of being in the talent and HR function. Uh, many of the leaders I speak with, some of these are colleagues, friends, some of our own customers at Codility. Uh, there's a couple things that are very true right now. One is, if you're, if you're a leader in this space, you're probably a little bit exhausted after these past two years, if we're being honest with ourselves. You're uh, you're really trying to keep up with the talent market right now. You're, you're trying to keep your head above water in terms of headcount, um, but you're also trying to engage the people that you have and, and, and keep them within your organization and to do right by them. But also um, during this time, we are, we are truly at a fork in the road, an intersection of the way work is being done. And if you're a leader in, in, these, in these functions today, talent and HR, it's also an incredible opportunity to be innovative and to be creative. And so with any change also comes the need to get buy-in, unfortunately. And also, unfortunately, we, in our roles, almost everything we do impacts everyone inside of our organizations. And so to get buy-in from the top down throughout the organization, we really need to be more data-minded. And we need to bring data to our conversations and to our arguments to get buy-in. And that's exactly what we want to talk with you about today. And I have an amazing panel to help us do that to really discuss how to build a data-driven HR and recruitment strategy. So Caitlin, Matt, and Simone, welcome. You are a powerhouse panel today. I think we could probably talk for hours. We're gonna try to keep this within 45 minutes. Um, as a reminder to all of you, um, uh, if you had any questions throughout this conversation, please drop that. Uh, please, please drop those into the question section. We really want to, we really want to get to as many of those as possible. We'll try to answer some throughout the session. We'll try to, if we have some time at the end, we'll, we'll catch up and sort of answer those as well. Uh, but Caitlin, Matt, and Simone, welcome. And I'd love for us to start out with each one of you just sharing a little bit about yourselves, your background, your role, the organization you work for, and then really just answering our first question right out of the gate, which is what is really your biggest recruitment challenge this year as we're well on our way into 2022. Um, Caitlin, let's let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. I am Caitlin. I lead the recruiting team at Lever, um, which is fun because we're the meta team. We're the end user of our own product. <laughs> um, so, so get to think a lot about um, how Lever works and how it should work and all of those those fun things while also bringing on all of the people who, who actually make it happen, um, which is really great. Um, to answer, answer your question, Jason, um, I think the biggest challenge, and this is probably not just Lever exclusive, but um, the market is just really hot. And so we're thinking about how we can move as fast as possible. Um, to ensure that we're we're able to to get all the folks that we we want to have on board, you know, on board and through the interview process, and you know, get those offers out as quickly as possible because people are just they're getting snapped up left and right. Um, so it's definitely a fun time uh, to be thinking about process improvements and those sorts of things. Yes, for sure. And welcome, Caitlin. We're we're so excited to have you here today. Um, Matt, let's let's go over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone on the stream. Uh, so my name is Matt Tagg. Uh, I've been in the TA space for about 15 years. I've previously led teams at LinkedIn, Microsoft, and Lyft. Uh, and my current role is at GEM, where I lead our customer talent advisory team. So part of that team is working with some of the, the leading companies in the world to help think about and scale their talent strategies. And I think uh, 
for this year, one of the key themes that I'm seeing with those companies and the work we do with them is how they really rethink their top of funnel, right? So moving from that transactional just-in-time one-to-one outreach that has defined a lot of sourcing and recruiting for years to being kind of always on nurturing uh, for companies that are hiring at scale. So helping them rethink that and design what that looks like is probably my my biggest uh, task with the companies we work with this year. Well, we can we can absolutely consult with you at Codility. We just brought on Jim, and we're loving it so far. And um, so, yeah, I think we have <laughs> we probably have a lot of discussion to do outside of this webinar for sure. Excellent. Um, but but welcome, and uh, Simone, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for having me. And um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, so I had an interesting little start to my career. I uh, started actually in journalism and. My first kind of stint in recruiting was actually like on-air talent at ABC News. And then, you know, I, I worked at a number of different media companies. I was at the Huffington Post um, where we were really working to build out their team. Um, and then onwards, I've kind of sat within the cross-section of media and tech with a special focus kind of on startups. Um, I was also part of the foundational team over at Amazon Studios where I helped scale that team and, and you know, bring them on, on where, to where they are now. Um, I am currently leading recruitment for WIT Media. We're a global technology company whose market um, leading licensing platform centrally connects data um, and teams of buyers and sellers to drive revenue. Um, we also actually have a super cool app called TV Time. It's the world's leading tracking tool for TVs and movies. Um, so we have like over 20 million users and essentially you can just create lists of different shows you're watching. They'll tell you when to tune in and it's, it's really fun. The, the biggest challenge right now, I would say, is, is really like this, this the competitive marketplace. I mean, we have this this moment in time where I think 4.5 million people in November decided to you know leave their jobs and essentially resign. So, you know, when you're when you're on the other end of it and you're trying to capture that talent and and really bring interesting people to the market and to you know the companies that you're working with, it's it can be really challenging. So, staying competitive, um, and I think staying competitive against the landscape of bigger companies that are spending more. Um, you know, so really thinking in terms of lean, scrappy ways to build, you know, the team of people that you, you functionally need to do your business. Yeah, no, no, we, we all definitely feel that. And, and again, welcome Simone and, and welcome to the rest of you as well. Um, so, so jumping right in and, and Caitlin, I'll, I'll throw this, this first question out to you and then we're going to make this as conversational as possible today. Um, but, but given the competitive climate that we all just spoke about um, for candidates and, and this kind of, world that we find ourselves in at the moment. What are the most important recruitment metrics that we should be tracking? And also, I think, as we speak about this, looking through the lens of the past year, is there anything that's, that, that's different in those metrics? Is there, any, is there a new metric that maybe we weren't thinking about before that we should be thinking about now? Or are we just really kind of doubling and tripling down on what we all always knew to be true? Yeah, it's a great question and one, one that I think about a lot. Um, so I can say for, for us at Lever, our sort of North Star recruiting metric is, is time to fill. Um, you know, ultimately, like our team's function is to ensure that every other team has the people that they need to, you know, accomplish their goals um, so that we can see success as a business. Um, and so we really track, you know, we have SLAs for a variety of different roles and then track how long it basically takes us to deliver a hire to the business and to the team. Um, and so that is remains still sort of our, our top priority is ensuring that we're quickly delivering um, hires and, and that we're, we're also delivering on quality. Um, I would say in this new world, you know, because we have had this really big focus on time to fill, our, our recruiters and I think our, our hiring managers are also pretty motivated. And so we've always moved pretty quickly with candidates. So time to hire has been something we've sort of tacitly kept an eye on, but has not been an area that we've really felt like we needed to double down um, until more recently um, when things have just like sped up really significantly. Um, yeah. And so we, we've we started to, to focus more on, on time to hire. And then I would say sort of on the third sort of component is, is really ensuring that we're continuing to keep an eye on our, um, our DEI goals. Um, and so we set goals particularly around um, diversity of the funnel at the sort of panel stage. Um, and so you know, I think it's easy when the market gets competitive to take your eye off of diversity, um, sort of 
trying to keep up and get, you know, butts in seats, but it's really, it can be a very slippery slope and a, a really dangerous move if you, if you sort of take your foot off the gas on ensuring that you're bringing in a diverse group of folks. Yeah, for sure. And I, I absolutely want to bring us back to the DNI conversation of this for sure. But but going back to time to fill really quick, and we felt this at Cability as well. We've actually brought this in as a core metric we're tracking within our executive team and our weekly meetings because it's that important and that critical. Yeah. But I'm wondering, Caitlin and Matt and Simone, please weigh in here as well. Not you don't necessarily have to tell us exactly what's going on in your business, but but I get this asked a lot. Like what is a good, what do you think is a good, you know, time to fill for sort of tech and non-tech positions right now? Like, how do you, yeah. you, you know, because, because a lot of leaders here, they're probably being asked this internally. What's the benchmark for this? And I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts on that data or just sort of just any high level offerings around that. Yeah. I mean, I can, I'm happy to share what we, what we, uh, strive for at Lever. Um, so for non-tech roles, it's 45 days. Um, and then for technical roles, 60 days. Um, and then we sort of have some outliers that are, you know, if it's super high level or, you know, super niche, um, we might make a different sort of goal there, but, um, really feel like those have proven to be sort of ambitious enough, but also, um, achievable. Um, and so that's, we track, actually like the percentage of roles that hit those SLAs. So rather than an average, um, we actually look at total percentage of roles that hit within our SLA. Got you. Got yeah. You. And I would just add to that too, Jason. So echo everything, you know, Caitlin said as well. I think my answer would be that it depends. Uh, so we work with a lot of different companies. It's going to depend there. We help them do a lot of work analyzing their own data to look at by a particular pipeline, what's their baseline. And then when then what steps can they take to improve that baseline over time? Uh, but yeah, definitely seeing, you know, those numbers and similar numbers to what Caitlin mentioned across different companies as well. Yeah. And I think it, I mean, it sort of depends also on your brand, right? I think, um, you know, we've got probably a, a wide majority of people on this that, you know, might not have, uh, you know, the brand necessarily where you're getting that pipeline at the very front end of the stage. So, I mean, I think in terms of, of data, you know, with regard to anything right now, you're seeing an increase, I'd say 20 to 30% longer than usual. Um, and I'd say, you know, those numbers that you threw out there, Caitlin, are great initials. I mean, I would say, like, you know, 45 is good for non-tech. You know, 60, I'd say we're closer to probably 60 for non-tech, depending on the nuance of the role. And then obviously, you know, maybe 75 days for um, tech. That being said, it also depends on the level of role that you're focused on hiring. And there's so much nuance behind that. I mean, and then the other thing I would say is, given how competitive the market is, while time to fill is really important and obviously time to hire is really important. And I would argue that those two numbers are, it, it depends on how you're recording those. I mean, obviously time to fill, like what do you consider fill versus hire? That would be an interesting thing. And again, there's nuance there, but I would, I would, I would want to like caution a little bit the team because there is this element of partnership that needs to be, you know, had between recruiters and hiring managers. So really important um, numbers that I'm tracking have to do with that partnership, right? So you know, how quickly are we seeing hiring managers and interviewers fill out scorecards? Like how quickly are they reviewing candidates and moving them through the stages? Um, you know, and how quickly are they kind of um, getting those scorecards? So literally like pulling reports around the number of hours that it takes for people who are supposed to be filling in scorecards, because we always know it's like a challenge to get feedback sometimes, but how quickly are they doing that? And how can we get that done faster? What are ways that we as recruiting leaders can really influence our team? So for example, I mean, we had recently, I think 2020, we were sitting at around 37 hours. We, we bumped it up to 19 hours. So literally we have people within a day putting feedback in. So that was a 50%, 7%, I think, increase, um, you know, overall in the speed at which people are doing this work. So, you know, if you have a lean team of recruiters, you really need hiring managers and interviewers to partner with you and to help influence, you know, and I would say that that goes along, you know, beyond obviously this process, but at the candidate close point, you've got those hiring managers and those interviewers dropping notes and really reminding the candidate why we stand out as a brand um, and why they should come mm -hmm. to us versus you, right? Simone, it's such a good call out in the scorecards. And admittedly, it was one thing that we weren't tracking as a metric in our business until recently. And I know a lot of the ATSs now can push this information to you. It's there. Yeah. Um, Caitlin, I know Lever does this. Um, so this is, this is a really big one. And if you're actually listening to recruiters, what's holding them up most of the time is, mm -hmm. Simone, to your, to your point, this relationship, it takes forever to get the feedback back. 
And if you are holding the business accountable to that, I think, I think that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, Matt, anything else that you're seeing, because I know that you work with a lot of different um, organizations, you're thinking about this a lot. Are there any other metrics outside of what we talked about that you think are critical or key right now? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that, Jason. And uh, I think, you know, in terms of the, the time to fail, time to hire, that obviously a critical metric. And I think that's critical to measure the output of the funnel. Uh, but just as importantly, we're seeing an increased focus on measuring the inputs to the funnel. So mm. if you have a sourcing team, you have recruiters, what's the aggregate like volume of outreach that they're doing? How effective is that outreach? How, how much? What's the response rate that you're getting? So those are some of the leading indicators that we see a lot of companies start starting to look at to predict some of those down funnel outcomes. Because if you don't have it at the top of the funnel, it's not going to come out at the bottom of the funnel, right? So it's the, really that uh, pairing that almost marketing mindset uh, to the top of the funnel and then pairing that with those down funnel metrics uh, to get that time to hire down. I love yeah, that. Matt, I, love it. I, I was going to just say, Matt, you're absolutely right. Like the conversion rates through the process are incredibly important um, and the speed at which people are moving through and, you know, they're, they're staying interested and staying engaged. Um, certainly really important. And, and by the way, Jim as a platform does this beautifully. So uh, <laughs> it can really help you out. But before we leave this part of the conversation, I do want to jump into one of the questions really quick, because I think a lot of people uh, and, and one of you actually hinted to this. I think it was you, Simone. Like, so what what is the majority opinion of what day is considered the fill date? So the date the candidate accepts the offer, the date the background clears, the day they start. How do all of you think about this time to fill? What What is actually time to fill? I can start. We, so we consider the fill date, the date that the candidate signs the offer um, because it is a recruiting metric. Um, and that is sort of where the recruiting quote unquote ends. Um, and so we felt like that was the the clearest way to, to sort of track our own, um, you know, proficiency. And so so that's the date we chose. I know a lot of companies actually choose to measure on like the day the person starts. Um, and it's really, it's, it's just sort of a, it's a, an individual decision. Um, <laughs> I think what really matters is that you're sort of have clean data and you're able to track it and you're able to sort of look at trends over time. Like what you're actually tracking matters less than being able to see the trend and ensuring that like the data that you're actually looking at is clean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would agree. I think that like, ultimately, I mean, the whole point of this metric is to understand how the recruiting team is partnering with the team, you know, internally and how they're partnering, you know, with candidates to move that forward. So, yeah, I mean, Phil is always going to be the date that the candidate signs. Um, and then obviously that's the, the perfect delineation between time to fill and time to hire time to hire is when the person actually starts. Um, and I think, some of those other areas of focus, I mean, the notion of like the background or, or issues or maybe somebody getting a counteroffer, because we probably have seen this happen quite a bit recently where, you know, candidates are beginning to ghost people, right? Like they're, mm -hmm. you know, they get to the offer stage, they sign the offer and then, you know, the, the, the person might not hear from them or there is an offer produced and then you might see them drop off entirely. Um, so I think that, you know, really kind of being clear on those benchmarks is, is really important to being able to continue to follow those metrics for sure. Totally. Yeah, I, I would echo echo both what Caitlin and Simone said there. I think, you know, marking it at, at time at, at sign date, I think is pretty clean way to do it, because after that, you're really measuring the efficiency of the onboarding process. Right. And by delineating that, that helps you look at the onboarding process more granularly to see if there are any issues there with how companies are welcoming people post signing. Yeah. And I think a lot, particularly that onboarding process, it's huge now when we're talking about retention, right? Especially given what talent want in the market today and what they're demanding of organizations, which, which maybe we'll get into a little bit, a little bit later, but um, switching gears really quick and just moving over to technology. So I'm curious how you all are leveraging technology for your recruitment strategies at your organization. So clearly we have some representation here in this group of, of companies that do this, but I'm, I'm I'm curious what are what are some technologies that you're that you're currently using that are really helping you to be um, bigger strategic players to move candidates through the funnel faster, um, and would would love to get some ideas and some thoughts around that. Um, Matt, would you want you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Mine's probably probably the easiest answer, but no surprise at Gem. We're using Gem a lot uh, for that, both for ourselves and for our customers. Uh, and I think it's really a couple of key areas uh, that we help them on from a technology perspective. So one is I think first and foremost, helping them debug their funnel. Uh, so bringing a lot of that data, both top of funnel and bottom of funnel to life to help them see, you know, what's the, what's the demographic makeup of your funnel? 
Uh, what's the efficiency of it? Where are the hangups? Where is the bias? Uh, helping them understand that as a baseline and then pairing that to scaled outreach strategies with nurture campaigns, text, uh, all of those kind of omni-channel outreach uh, into one complete picture there. So that's kind of what we do. That's our bread and butter. Uh, and, and we do that with customers all day long. So that's that's what we're focused on. All right. So Jim, for sure, something to consider. Yes. Uh, Simone, what about you? Anything anything you're thinking about these days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think it's really important in you know, this strange moment in time where obviously speed is one of the most important um, elements that we have to leverage. I mean, I'd say automation of any kind, right? So, I mean, scheduling, right? Like, that, you know, if you we have a recruiting coordinator resource and it's fantastic and we, you know, we leverage that quite a bit, but anything that you can take off that um, person and, and that, you know, essentially that move that burden away, that's really going to be important. That's going to move this process along quickly. So really focusing in on like things like automated calendar scheduling. Calendly is one great thing. And it depends on what ATS you're using. And Lever is fantastic, obviously. Um, and, and there's a lot of integration with that. But really focusing in on, on products and, and bits of technology that can make the process smoother and more, you know, just mm -hmm. faster in general. Yeah. And, and many of, let's be honest, many of our recruiting teams right now are running lean as well, right? Like we're... Yep. Our, our recruiters are getting poached. We're seeing salaries extremely high in this space. Um, and, and, and speaking of that, I, I do want to I do want to continue moving us and then get to some more questions here in a moment. But um, compensation, if you're in the you know, if you're in the talent and the HR space, compensation is critical right now. We're you know, it, it's coming up in all of our, you know, you know, with with every role that we're recruiting, it's almost like we can't keep up. And so, and it feels like we're behind a lot. And so I'm wondering how are, how are our, all of you dealing with this challenge of compensation and are you paying enough and, 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 and what are you doing? But also, are you leveraging data in these discussions with the business and with candidates? And if so, how are you doing that? And, and Caitlin, I think you, I, I know that you've got a lot of thoughts around this. So I'm, I'm going to lead with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, compensation is definitely a, it's a, it's hot topic at the moment. Um, you know, I think we are thinking a lot about, you know, wanting to make sure we're staying competitive, both with candidates that we're bringing in, as well as ensuring that we're maintaining pay equity with our current employees. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of companies are sort of making the choice right now to chase after, you know, new talent, and they're going to pay top dollar. And, I'd be very curious to see sort of what they're, how much sort of downstream they're looking at the impacts. Um, because, you know, at Lever, we really believe in, you know, strong pay equity practices internally and ensuring that um, we are sort of not digging ourselves into a hole. And so thinking about ensuring that every time we look at our, you know, perks and benefits, every time we look at our compensation bands, we do that twice a year. Um, we have performance and rewards twice a year. Um, and so ensuring that we're both, you know, staying competitive in the market and also making sure we're staying competitive with our current employees, especially with, um, you know, all of the, all of the movement in the market. Um, you know, I think that that feels incredibly important to us right now as well. Got you. And, and so Simone, I know you recently said one thing to me, which I really appreciate. You said you can't keep chasing the dollar and I've kept thinking about that over and over. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more from, from you on this topic as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, I mean, again, it's just such a weird time. I mean, recruiters alone, I think we're, we're looking at across this job family, 14% raises. I mean, you know, Amazon actually just shifted their compensation structure. Um, so their bases went from like 160, which was previously the cap to 350. I mean, that's, that's like, I mean, you know, you see companies like Reddit getting rid of their one year like equity cliff. So essentially now just on day one, you begin to earn, you know, so it, it's a very odd time. And, and I think what Caitlin mentioned around equity and parity, I mean, that's so incredibly important. And that's why you really have to be structured in the way that you think about compensation. The other thing is, if you don't have all that money, right, you have to be really thoughtful around, you know, some of those elements that I mentioned before. And I think at a certain point, Jason, you know, and this is what we were sort of talking about before, but like at a certain point, you can't keep, I mean, you got to say to the person, this is a critical, so we can't, we can't match that, like go enjoy the other offer or take that other opportunity because ultimately, aren't we looking for candidates who 
want the opportunity and who want to grow and who want to be part of a company that, you know, are inspired by what we do. And ultimately, if you have this person continuously coming back with the four other offers that they have and, you know, trying to get you to come up 30 to 50 grand, like it's just not going to work at some point. So I think there is an element where, you know, I mean, we have, we have a job and, and our job isn't to always say yes. Our job is to sometimes say no, but um, so I think that that's really important. But then the other thing is, what are other ways that we can close people? Because I think I've seen a couple of questions now where, you know, if it can't, if a company can't make the investment and can't spend all this extra money, like how are we supposed to do things? So really leveraging your exec team to help close candidates um, and, and working again in partnership, moving quickly. You know, if you know um, what candidates, other opportunities that they have, if you're sometimes first to offer, you have a better chance at scoring that talent because an offer in hand is way better than no offer at all. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can play into that uh, when you're doing that, those final close calls. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important is listen to candidates. What do they want? I mean, are they like interested in a certain kind of opportunity, interested in leadership down the line? What else can you promise them that won't cost you um, as a company? You know, what else can you kind of build into the offer? Can you change titles? Can you like increase like signing bonuses? Can you, there's so many different things and there's so many different levers, <laughs> ironically, levers that you can play with to make an offer close, right? So those are things I think that are really important you know, total rewards. It's, it's literally a total reward situation. Yeah. You're not yeah. just offering cash. And, you know, the other thing is equity. If you're part of a company that's pre-IPO, there's equity at stake. So really telling that story, sometimes having, you know, our CEO, our CEO is fantastic. He's wonderful. He just jumps on a call sometimes with candidates and helps, you know, close them at the end yeah. of the stage. So thinking broadly and being really, you know, outside the box in terms of your approach is important, I think, in this particular instance. Simone, I think it's a really good call out because, you know, pre-pandemic and, and before crazy comp increases, it was easier to say money's not everything, right? But when you're yeah. seeing multi gaps of 20 and 30, 40, 50 percent at times, it's hard for anyone, no matter how engaged they are in an organization, not to step back yeah. and go, well, that's life changing for me, right? And but the reality is we know this isn't going to be forever, right? As eventually, um, eventually things, things are going to catch up. But I do think going back to the point of just really thinking about what what you are excelling at, like if you do have work flexibility, that is huge. I mean, more candidates are demanding that more than ever. Not every company is offering that yet, but but that but that is huge. Or your L and D function and the growth opportunities that that Simone that Simone sort of spoke to. Um, Matt, I wanted to call out. I wanted to just throw a question at you really quick that we got from the audience before we move on to a few questions around DE and I. Um, but. Um, there's a question in a very, you know, in a very um, candidate driven market, what are the candidate conversion rates your teams deem successful from initial outreach through conversion into the actual pipeline? Is there any kind of thing high level that you can, that you're willing to speak to around that? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a broad question. So I'll try to try to delineate a little bit uh, here, but I would say in general at the top of the funnel, you know, when you think about the outreach that a team is doing, whether that's through channels like in mail, whether that's through text, whether that's through email, uh, generally, what we see is, you know, for tech roles, anywhere from 13% on the low end to 30% on the high end for tech specific roles uh, across customers. And then for, for other organizations that uh, we'll see or for other uh, roles, we'll see anywhere up to 50%. But what's really unique that we're seeing uh, is that a lot of the response rates that our customers get happen on that second, third and fourth outreach not on the first outreach. So that's a critical point that we're seeing is that a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of recruiters will just stop at the first outreach and move on. So a very transactional process. Uh, so shifting from that to a nurture based process where you're reaching out programmatically three, four, five, six times over a year in a smart and personalized way, that's where you yield a lot of the response rates there. Got you. I, I love the sort of nurture focus. And, and you're right. Uh, a lot of recruiters start to back off after those first touch points. Um, yeah, so, that's, yeah. I was just going to I was just going to jump in and say that, yeah, 100 percent follow up. I think that people forget about that um, when you're doing recruiting yourself. Follow up. Remember to you know find potentially different ways to connect with that person as well. So if init the initial message is a LinkedIn message, like, you know, figure out their email. There are a lot of fantastic lead plugins that are sometimes free for companies that are out there that are a little bit more lean. Um, so look for their email, like find a way to communicate with them in a different way. Um, the other thing I was going to just say is, you know, when you're doing the reach outs yourself, like I'm seeing right in line with Matt, 27% conversion through the process. So I just mm. wanted to like say that you're right. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. I love it. I um, There's a question around here around, have there been any specific tools you find more useful than others to evaluate market salary and comp? They're giving examples of, you know, option impact or paid. I'll just say really quickly, I, I, I feel the pain here. And actually through the pandemic, no matter what the, the, the platform was, it wasn't really keeping up. I think, I think leaders were so busy, they weren't inputting the data. And honestly, it, you couldn't really trust it. I recently brought on a platform called Comza from Cultivate People. I'm a huge fan. I think they work great globally. They're based out of the Bay Area, I believe, um, from a UI, UX perspective, from uh, from where they pull their data, how 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 involved they are in the in the data input, because because that's what's important, right? It's like how how protected is the data input. They also, in their contracts, give you so many consulting hours a month, which honestly every organization needs right now. And so I'm a huge fan. Again, that's um, it's a platform called Comza through Cultivate People. Is there anything else that any of you would add around that or, or that you're using? I would just echo that it seems like there's definitely a lag. And so any of those platforms, I mean, it's you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt just because things are moving so, so quickly right now. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, we're seeing 20 to 30% off those numbers, right? So you've got these numbers that are in the surveys. And I think, I mean, it's, it's strange because you think that the surveys are up to date, but they're not necessarily. The, the one thing that I think people sometimes forget about is if you're asking candidates in your ATS um, straight up for like compensation expectations, which is a very common thing. I mean, I'm sure most of the folks that are on this um, are doing that in some capacity or even during that first recruiter call. There you go, some live data that you can use. So find a way to like crunch that and essentially vi visualize that and help really use that as a data-driven piece because that's the only thing that you're going to have that's really up to date. Totally, I love that. Yeah, and I, th I think you know what I see as well. Just echoing echoing what Caitlin and Simone said that uh, the data that's out there is backwards looking. So I love that concept of bringing in the real time data from your own team, Simone. I think that's fantastic. I would add to that too. I think a lot of companies are looking at or trying to gauge business impact of roles. So, you know, the, the data externally is the data externally, but you can look at internally for the roles you're hiring for as best as you can. What's the business impact, right? And really trying to tie that to whether you need to increase comp in a certain area or not based on the true business impact that role is delivering to the company. So not an easy exercise, but that one can often inform a lot there as well. It's, it, it's, it's a hard exercise when you start thinking about equitability across the org as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes challenging. And speaking of all those things, I do want to talk a little bit about DE&I. And I'm wondering um, what, how you all are prioritizing DE&I hiring right now and just what you're doing in general. So I think Caitlin or Simone, one of you spoke to this in your introduction uh, for, forgive me for, for forgetting which one of you it was, but um, it was Caitlin. Uh, 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 Caitlin. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's sort of like this, right? Like DE&I, you know, you know, the, the conversation around this is cyclical at times and there's ups and there's flows, but when it's a candidate driven market and companies are hunger for talent, sometimes it doesn't become the, the priority is not there as much, right? You know, you're just, you're just, you're just, just trying just to get through the day. Right. But, but what are you all doing in this market to prioritize DE&I hiring? Uh, Caitlin, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, so we um, sort of in, for our recruiting team track um, top of funnel sort of, you know, diversity um, as well as diversity at the panel stage. We landed on the panel stage because we wanted it to be, we wanted it to feel like it was far, far enough long in the process that people were really getting like, you know, a crack at it. Um, they were, you know, were, it's they're in serious consideration for the role. Um, and then early enough in the pipeline that we're not actually making decisions based on, um, you know, gender, ethnicity, race, any of those things that you should not be making decisions based on. Um, but that we felt like if we had a really diverse funnel, um, or really diverse panel of, you know, candidates to choose from that it would, you know, naturally increase the diversity um, of our, of our workforce. And so um, top of funnel, because we felt like that was very much within recruiting teams control. And then that sort of panel stage to, to really ensure that we actually are, you know, putting forth a diverse pool of candidates for, for selection. And, and Kent, sorry, are you, are you actively in real time sort of reporting on those metrics internal in turn with the team? Are you tracking them? Is it something you share with the company? Yeah, we share it. We share it out with the company every all hands. So every two weeks we, we give an update on how we're doing. Um, it's something we track 
um, through Lever. We have a diversity insight survey. Um, and so that really helps us to, to track. It's completely divorced from their actual candidate profile. Um, and so, so we're able to, to sort of make decisions um, around strategy without um, it sort of impacting, you know, individuals, you know, comfort level with, you know, thinking that, you know, maybe their, their application might be sort of considered differently. Got you, got you. Anyone else, any other thoughts just in terms of what you're doing right now or what may be different? Totally. I think, um, you know, we're at this point where, of course, the market's super competitive, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, I think there's still very separate issues. We need like a hyper focus on DEI and it shouldn't, you know, the fact that we need to hire faster shouldn't really come in in that in, in like the way of that. So I think that we need to separate out those issues um, in order to, to have, have us functionally um, achieve goals. I think the other thing really um, is that we're at this interesting point where maybe it's a benefit, you know, suddenly we're, we're all distributed, you know, for the most part, like suddenly we can tap into markets that we haven't been tapping into previously. Um, you know, we can also look to physical geographical markets where again, you know, people are potentially um, looking for opportunities and are, you know, ready to go. Um, the other component to this also is, you know, if we're not finding our perfect candidate within a certain number you know, let's say months or a certain time benchmark. The key thing is to use, you know, again, the relationships that your recruiters have with hiring managers to really influence them and, and to think through, well, like, can we hire opportunistically? Can we hire somebody that might not have all the skills on day one since we can't find that person necessarily? And can we, you know, build out that L&D component of their, their experience and really get them to where we want them to be, which is, I think, a really interesting moment in time and can certainly help, you know, some of those DEI points. The other thing is in terms of the metrics, I like the idea of the, of course, top of funnel to understand who's, you know, and I would say, unfortunately, not every ATS is like perfect in terms of giving you that data. Um, I know Lover is great at it, but like other ATSs out there, unfortunately, just don't have that capacity or you have to pay a ridiculous amount of money to like get to that level of data, um, which is, you know, sometimes frustrating. But the other two pieces is to really understand the hiring manager, that first touch point. And, and seeing that conversion rate through to panel. So while the panel is important, it's just really important to, to track and understand if there is bias sometimes with specific hiring managers that you're working with. You can remind them um, through that process. You can give them those little nudges around bias and really trying to think through and know their own biases in order to eliminate them effectively. Um, so I would say, you know, those three touch points are going to be the most important in terms of metrics and data. Yeah, I, I would just add to that as well. I think all of those pieces are critical that both uh, Caitlin and Simone mentioned. I think also, you know, again, adopting that marketing mindset uh, that we've been talking about through this session of that top of funnel, you know, when you think of the different uh, different groups that you may be wanting to target from a DEI perspective, what's the persona? Like really designing the persona, what does that person want? What are they looking for from a total rewards EVP perspective? Uh, and I think one tactical thing I've seen a lot of companies do very successfully is leverage the wisdom and power of your ERGs, right? So go to them, help them work with you to craft that message that resonates, uh, and then pair that with the ability to track the efficiency of that message. So if you, you know, if you go to Grace Hopper and you get the resume book of 3,000 resumes, work work with your your women's ERG internally, craft that message, and nurture them over the next year with the right messaging, and then track that through the funnel. So that's an example of you know, pairing with the ERG, but then also using data to see whether that outreach is actually working and converting. Yeah. Yeah. And the I other love... thing I would, oh, sorry, I was just going to say the fun. other thing yeah. that, it, that is important to track is just the diversity of interview panels. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's a really key component in terms of, of getting that talent on board. Um, so that's something that people should, should remember that, that is an important thing. And it's something really easy as recruiters to control. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the more you track that data, when things post hire when things do go wrong, as they sometimes do, you know, it's not a, it's not a perfect system going back and being able to look at what went wrong. And if you're able to see that you did not have a very diverse panel and then the other side of that, uh, in some of the performance issues coming up around and things like inclusion, um, uh, it's, 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 it's a huge warning and a huge red flag. So I, I agree with that. The only other thing I would add is absolutely the more, the more you can introduce in terms of work flexibility and hiring location, the more you're going to be able to, be able to attract and secure 
a, a diversity of talent. And I know not every organization is able to do that today, but, but if you are an organization where your leaders aren't necessarily in line with that yet, but they also want you to hire more diversity, it's a really good argument to bring to the table. And I think a lot of companies here could even help you with data around that for sure. Yeah, um, that's just Jason, just on that really quickly. I mean, Simone touched on that as well, but like, you know, we talk about the great resignation, great migration, all of these things, but it's actually like, we've never had a better opportunity specifically from a DNA perspective. It's almost the great attraction, right? It's our mm -hmm. opportunity to go beyond the geo that we were constrained to, you know, over the last few years to look much more broadly to unlock that talent. So like now's the time to go and do that for sure. Yep. Yeah. It's great. It's great. So we have about five minutes left. So I'm gonna throw one more question at you and then maybe we'll try to answer a question or two, but, um, when and really when we're thinking about the candidate experience, I'm really curious how you all have had to add or adjust your processes uh, based on the current competitive market. So especially when we go back to that time to fill, we need to move quickly. And I'm really curious, are you eliminating anything? Are you adding things like what are you doing to create a really amazing candidate experience, but but also to still sort of be aggressive with 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 your time to fill metric? Speed. <laughs> speed. <laughs> um, I would say speed. And I also think that that level of engagement, um, transparency, candor, um, you know, giving candidates feedback at every stage, helping them really understand where they are um, and being really honest. I mean, I think that the number one thing that I've communicated to every recruiter that I've ever had on a team is don't ever drop the ball from a communication standpoint. Don't ever go unresponsive, don't ever go dark, because that is the number one thing. If you look at all of the Glassdoor reviews for every big company, the the like majority of the negative reviews are because somebody dropped the ball and somebody forgot to email someone back or didn't close them out after like a six week process with six different stages. I mean, if we're gonna you know, ensure that we're hiring a high bar and have really sometimes cumbersome processes, and I'm, I'm gonna say like we all do, I mean, there's assessments to our process, there are multiple touch points, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that we owe candidates who've gone through that process are, are, is going to be responsiveness, speed and candor. So I think like, you know, at Amazon, we had a two and five day rule, which I always thought was fantastic. But like something like that, where you're letting candidates know where they are and you're you know closing them out within two days, for example, of a phone screen and then within five days of a panel interview stage, like things like that, really just having cadences that you've agreed to with your stakeholders. And again, to move feedback along, it's gonna be really important. And telling candidates, being honest with them, you know, hey, mm -hmm. this is what we ended up doing. This is why you didn't make the cut. People will really react positively to that and they will stay engaged. And I've had so many situations where people have straight up given me candidates. Like, <laughs> they're like, okay, so I took this other offer or I wasn't the right fit for you guys, but here's someone else who I think is could be really interesting and valuable. So. I think honesty, candor, all of that stuff is going to be really important at the moment. Authenticity and honesty yep. go a long way, right? Like yeah, candidates totally. know the difference. They're humans. Like they they feel when you're being authentic, you're doing the best you can, you're being real versus yep. versus you're not you're not really putting that much work into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I would actually even going back to Simone's earlier point around automation. Um, so you know, thinking about how you can make any step in the process just a little bit easier um, when you think about the time sort of across all the roles that you're hiring for, across all the hiring managers, all the recruiters, like even, you know, just a couple of minutes can can really make a big impact. Um, so like definitely think automation is, is a huge part of it. I would also say, you know, one of the things that we did um, is we created like a little micro site for candidates mm -hmm. um, that has tons of information on benefits, perks, what the process looks like. Um, we basically just did like a brain dump of what lives and has lived mostly in the, the brains of recruiters into this micro site. And then um, we're able to share it out with candidates so that they can sort of self-service some of their own um, their own questions. They can spend time reading. There's employee testimonials. Um, we've sort of put together this, this place where candidates can go and, and get answers to their questions. Um, and also, you know, ideally really sell them on the opportunity um, along the way. But we're also hoping that it it means that, you know, they can sort of spend less of their time with, um, with their interviewers or with their recruiter asking some of these, like, more like FAQ type questions. Um, and then we can sort of use that time maybe a little bit more 
impactful. Yeah, I would assume it saves time overall versus adding a few more days at the end at offer stage, right? Where yep. before exactly. they accept. Um, exactly. So we are about out of time. And I thought maybe before we say goodbye, just giving each of you an opportunity to wrap things up. So 2022, an intense year, a lot going on. What's one, you know, just one advice you want to leave with everyone or one offering or one idea or one thought, but before we go that, that people can go away with. Um, Matt, let's start with you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and kick it off. I would say, uh, I, I've been saying this recently in different panels and I truly believe this, but uh, 2022, it's never been a better time to be in recruiting. It's never been a worse time to be in recruiting. Uh, but that being <laughs> said, uh, we've always asked for a seat at the table. I think we have that seat at the table now. Like this is yeah. our year to prove that we deserve that for sure. That's so good. <laughs> Thank you. Simone. I think it comes down to accountability um, and partnership. Um, those I think are the two themes that I've really, you know, it felt historically throughout my career have been big focuses, but like right now, you know, being accountable when it comes to working with internal stakeholders and then obviously with candidates too. And then that partnership, I mean, we're, we're at this like really weird sort of, you know, point in, in any recruiter's career where you're essentially like, just as um, responsible for your relationship with candidates as you are for those internal stakeholders. So we're really, you know, I, I, like a peacemaker of sorts and a, a diplomat. And then at the same time, you know, a project manager and sometimes a, a psychologist, you know, we're, we're doing everything. So I think it's really important to, um, you know, sometimes take a deep breath and step away from the situation and then be really objective in the way that we handle ourselves. Because it's, it is to Matt's point, we're, we're at this really important point where we are so important to the process. Um, that we need to like take ownership of that and go with it. <laughs> yeah, this function has a lot to offer and what better way than with data as well, right? So, yep, and absolutely. Uh, Caitlin. Yeah, so I think one of the things I've been telling myself, um, especially when I feel a little overwhelmed with the, you know, the market at the moment is that, you know, it's, it's definitely a tough time because there's so much movement, but it's also a really exciting time because there are so many people willing to move. Um, and so if you really think about the opportunity, um, because candidates are really very open-minded, um, passive candidates are, I feel like more willing to get on the phone. They're more willing to, to sort of respond to your email because this is the world that we live in today. So really capitalizing on that, I think is, is super important. Absolutely. Well, Caitlin, Simone, Matt, Thank you so much for just a really fruitful conversation. Thank you to our partners as well, uh, Jim and Lever, for helping to make this happen. Thank you to all of you. We wish you the absolute best of success in this recruiting endeavor and this people engagement endeavor in 2022. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.